Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christine Chin, Dean of the School of International Service. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event on behalf of American University and SIS. Many months ago, when we thought to mark the upcoming 20th anniversary of 9-11 with an event that focused on US involvement in Afghanistan, we had little idea just how timely it would be. For this reason, I'm particularly grateful for the generous participation of our esteemed guests. First, I'd like to thank our moderator, Earl Anthony Wayne, who is Hearst Senior Professorial Lecturer and Distinguished Diplomat in Residence here at SIS. Ambassador Tony Wayne is also a Public Policy Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, a Senior Non-Resident Advisor at the Atlantic Council and the Center for Security and International Studies. Serving 40 years as a US diplomat, Ambassador Wayne was posted in Kabul as coordinating director for development and economic policy of development and economic affairs, and as deputy director from 2009 to 2011. In 2010, the US Senate confirmed him as a career ambassador the highest rank in the US Foreign Service. His last post was ambassador to Mexico from 2011 to 2015. And now on to our speakers. David Petraeus served over 37 years in the US military, including tours in Afghanistan. He culminated his military service with six consecutive commands as a general officer, five of which were in combat, including command of the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan from 2010 to 2011. General Petraeus graduated with distinction from the US Military Academy, has held academic appointments at six universities, received U numerous US military, State Department, NATO, and UN medals, and he's been decorated by 13 countries. Following his service in the military, General Petraeus served as the director of the CIA. He is currently partner at KKR and chairman of the KKR Global Institute. Thank you and welcome to SIS, General Petraeus. We are also honored that former Ambassador of Afghanistan, Roya Rahmani, can join us today. Ambassador Rahmani was appointed as Afghanistan's first female ambassador to the United States by President Ghani in 2018, and she served in that post until July of this year. Her prior work includes service with nonprofit organizations in Canada and the USA, focused on human rights, women's empowerment, and education. She also worked in the Afghan government at the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In 2016, she was appointed as the first female ambassador from Afghanistan to Indonesia, and the first ever Afghan ambassador to ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. In addition to her advocacy for women's rights, Ambassador Rahmani was, has promoted the essential role women play in the peace process. She has received numerous awards for her work on equitable family rights and her advocacy of peace in Afghanistan. Selamat datang dan terima kasih Ambassador Rahman. Finally, Shamila Chaudhry is president of the American Pakistan Foundation and a senior South Asia fellow at New America. She has served 12 years, or she has 12 years of experience working in the US government, including in the White House as director of Pakistan and Afghanistan on the National Security Council. Ms. Chaudhry earned her MA in international affairs here at SIS. So from one SIS alumna to another, welcome home to our alma mater, Shamila. We're very grateful to all of you for your time today. I will now hand over the Zoom mic to Ambassador Wayne, who will begin the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Chen. It's a great pleasure to be here and to help moderate this conversation. It's a very important time for Afghanistan, for US relations uh, with the region and 
partners in the international community, and I would say, and rivals in the international community to how we handle this cluster of issues going forward. We know that there are still many people seeking to leave Afghanistan, uh, many with ties to the United States. There is a massive humanitarian crisis growing in Af Afghanistan. The UN Secretary General uh, reiterated his, his call for support for the humanitarian appeal yesterday and noted that there are 18 million Afghans in need of humanitarian assistance right now. <coughs> The government in Afghanistan, there is no government in Afghanistan yet. The Taliban have not formed a new government. Um, that, that is in the works. Um, there, as we, we know very, very sadly, there are other terrorist groups at work in Afghanistan still present. So there, there's a lot going on. And, and several people have noted the possibility of cascading crises in Afghanistan. So we're going to explore today what the United States should be doing in this situation, um, how the US and the international community should uh, look at dealing with the Taliban going forward, what the implications are for our broader international credibility and for policy in the region, among other questions. So I'd like to start off and, and ask everybody to give a sense of what you think the priority tasks are right now for the United States. Tony Blinken, our Secretary of State has said, this is uh, really, we're going, our diplomacy now that's going to lead. So what should our diplomacy be doing? General Petraeus, can I ask you to start off? You can, Tony, thanks. And great to be reunited with you, having served uh, together, of course, uh, in the shadow of the Hindu Kush uh, in Afghanistan when you were the deputy ambassador and, and I was privileged to be the commander. Um, look, I think you can, you can question whether we should even be where we are in Afghanistan. And obviously uh, some of us have had different views about what alternatives there were, uh, but we are where we are. And I think by and large, the administration does have uh, the right priorities. It is to continue to reach out to those American citizens who are still left in the country and either didn't choose to leave or weren't able to leave uh, during the period of the, the very impressive airlift that was conducted, uh, albeit a, a certainly a costly one, recalling that there were nearly 200 Afghan citizens, innocent civilians killed and 13 of our soldiers. Um, beyond that, needless to say, there are green card holders uh, that also will not have gotten out. Uh, I'm waiting to find out how many of the special immigrant visa holders and applicants and family members did make it through the entry control points and onto a plane uh, to a third country where they're being processed. That, that number is uh, not available right now. We estimate uh, that there were some somewhere between 15 and 18,000 individuals plus family members, so times two or three, uh, that were in the process of applying for a special immigrant visa that, that we hoped would get out. I'm part of No One Left Behind, a nonprofit that focuses on that particular issue. Um, and then, of course, we've got to start thinking already about what this government, uh, how it will govern once, as you note, the government is actually formed. They've just had several days of meetings in Kandahar uh, with the senior leaders to determine that government. Uh, clearly, there's still some fighting going on. Uh, but what will be the character of that government? How will they treat their citizens? How in particular will they treat uh, women and girls? Can they still go to school, go to college? Again, what will be the nature of rights that they allow to the citizens who are in the country? Uh, and then what will be the nature of assistance that we're willing to provide them, given that we have enormous leverage over that government right now. Let's keep in mind that this is, you know, the dog that's been chasing the car for 20 years is now in the driver's seat or say the opposition party in the back bench has been, you know, hurling epithets and criticisms and actually violence at those in power. Uh, they are now the party in power. Um, it's gonna be a lot tougher, frankly, in many respects than it was on the back benches. They're broke. Uh, the budget that used to be largely funded by the U.S., Japan, U.K., and a handful of other major donor countries, uh, that's not happening. The funds are frozen to which they would have had access uh, previously, and even the IMF special drawing rights are not accessible to them. It's $450 million that was supposed to go to 
Afghanistan. So they're in a very, very difficult spot. You and I know very well that the government in normal good times could only raise between one and $2 billion in revenue from some customs duties and taxes. They might add to it the proceeds of the illegal narcotics trade that they have long controlled. But again, that doesn't in, in any way fill a gap of what is probably, again, all told, because it's hard to get your hands around it because so much was done directly. As you know, we funded the 300,000 um, Afghan security forces, salaries, operating expenses, food, everything else. Um, we're talking about, again, over $10 billion. And in the, in the absence of that, the lights could literally go out in Kabul. So your mention that this could be a humanitarian crisis uh, I, I fear it could be sooner rather than later. And it's incumbent on the Taliban, I think, to establish a certain degree of conditions by their governance that will both uh, justify countries like ours providing assistance and, and also make it possible because there will be many in countries like ours who will say, why are we funding the very people who blew up our soldiers and 66,000 Afghan security forces fighting for their country who died, uh, and even a, a larger number of civilians. So it's a very uncertain, and I haven't yet, of course, gotten to the Islamic State, which because of the Taliban breaking everybody out of the prisons during their fight to Kabul or their process to Kabul, uh, now has some 2,000 fighters on Afghan soil that has already carried out the first terrible, horrific and barbaric suicide bombing. Um, so a very, very uncertain future, I think, uh, for uh, the country that you and I loved and the citizenry to which we got very close, particularly is under rule of uh, a regime that probably won't take them all the way back to the seventh century uh, as they were in the mid 1990s until 2001, uh, but, but certainly is not going to allow them the kinds of freedoms, opportunities, and and rights uh, that they did have under the previous Afghan government, however imperfect, maddening, frustrating, uh, and so forth that it may have been. Thank you very much. I, I remember warmly those days together and how we both became so attached to yeah. Afghans during that time there. And, and so I'd like to ask Ambassador Romani, as a former representative of Afghan, understand as an Afghan, what do you see right now as the priority? What would you like to see the United States uh, doing with immediacy and rapidity? Thank you, Ambassador Wayne. It's great to be with all of you uh, once again. Um, priorities, I have to break it down into two sections. One, um, what I would think US, for the US or the US people, which I cannot speak on behalf of, but I could think that, that based on what they are saying might be feasible or possible. Uh, and then as an Afghan. So let me start first um, from a uh, perspective because we all heard Secretary Blinken saying that he would like to pursue diplomacy. Now, this is happening in, in a situation that the embassy has closed down. Uh, I believe that the priority for diplomacy uh, as a path is uh, regional diplomacy. The region has had an immense uh, uh, role in what is to happen in Afghanistan. And now given the situation that we are uh, and all the uh, very difficult um, circumstances that we are facing, uh, some of which were recounted uh, very well by General Petraeus, or uh, we really need uh, to have uh, the regional countries play uh, at least somewhat more constructive role. Uh, that's, uh, I think priority in terms of diplomacy should be really uh, put into that. Secondly, in terms of the modality of the assistance, there is a continuously talk about that um, the military uh, mission is over, but the, the relationship is not. Now, in the absence of a government, and even should there be a government, the government that it cannot be acceptable uh, or recognized by international community, what would that the modality of the assistance be? How are you going to reach to the communities and uh, address the humanitarian uh, crisis that is that's bubbling up. 
Um, and uh, thirdly, it is the long-term goal. Um, we hear from the leaders here uh, in the United States that it has been the counterterrorism has been the goal and it has been achieved and we want to make sure and that's the only interest we have had uh, being in Afghanistan. Is that fully off the table? Is it checked? I mean, basically, uh, based on what we are discussing and uh, General Petraeus already alluded to that, that we are not uh, in a position to say that that problem is over. So I, I would say these would be from a US perspective, for, but as an Afghan, the very first priority that I am asking the international community is not to lose access uh, because as, uh, the troops completely withdrew as the evacuation process is over. The journalists have left. The, soon you will not know what is happening there. That is going to be very difficult for us and that's for you as well. So sustaining, maintaining access is the key. Now I am really uh, uh, getting very worried uh, both about the issues, uh, some of which uh, again General Petraeus mentioned in terms of the infrastructure, whether they would be able to afford it or not, that includes electricity, internet access and whatnot. But in addition to that, uh, the Taliban have already made some statements saying that they are going to close down YouTube or WhatsApp or uh, Facebook. This is going to cut us down from the rest of the world. This is a very immediate need. Whether you want to do assistance or diplomacy or human rights, we, you need to have access. Thank you. That's an excellent point. The, ability, the transparency for all of us to see what's happening and for Afghans to communicate out what's happening is vital. Thank you. Shamilo, do you want to offer some perspective from your expertise in the region, as well as working at the National Security Council, about what you see as priorities? Sure. Thank you, Ambassador Wayne. Um, I concur kind of on a tactical level with what General Petraeus and Ambassador Romani said about what is most pressing. But as a student of international affairs and foreign policy, if I'm asked to identify a priority, I have to think that it must be linked to a strategy. I can't identify priorities if a strategy is not clear. And what I'm hearing from the administration is um, similar to past strategies that we've had in Afghanistan, minus the military footprint, and now on top of that, minus the diplomatic footprint. So whatever needs to be done in the short run and the medium run is going to be all the more difficult because we don't have uh, the access as Ambassador Romani mentioned, and it's occurring um, in the midst of such great instability um, to General Petraeus's points. And so um, I, I wanna make a point of, uh, uh, Tony Blinken said something about we will, and so did uh, the president, we will maintain our leverage as the United States. Now that's gonna be really difficult if you don't have an embassy, if you don't have thousands of troops on the ground. And so um, we are right to assume that diplomacy is um, in short order, the priority, but the tactics behind that become really important. So not doing one-on-one -on -one diplomacy, we need to talk to the, the different countries in the region, some of whom we will disagree with vehemently on human rights, on certain um, approaches to the Taliban, but that's going to be really important we need consistent and clear communication about what we are doing to protect American citizens, green card holders, and SIVs and other Afghan allies on the ground. We made a commitment to them. We, we said that August 31st was not a cliff. We have to follow through on that, okay? And then finally, in terms of visibility, um, we, don't have any, we don't have any eyes and ears on the ground. And with each day that passes, probably less so. And so ensuring that the international community can do its job so that we all can um, kind of maintain the leverage, the little leverage that we each have, that's really, that's gonna be really important in the near term. Thank you very much, Milo. Thanks to all of you. Okay, now let's, let's build on this a little bit. I agree with all the points that each of you have made. So how do we now best take the leverage that we have, the leverage that others have, bring that together get clear messages from not just the United States, but from the region and other places to the Taliban, and then use that to leverage both meeting the humanitarian needs in the short term, which is different than 
easing sanctions or releasing funds or doing other things or even recognizing governments. So what, what kind of steps or processes do you think we should think about taking to put this focus on diplomacy into effective action? Uh, General Petraeus, please. Uh, unmute. The most famous words of the Zoom era, uh, you're on mute. Um, this has begun, to be fair to the administration. I think they have been pretty aggressive. Uh, they pulled together the UN Security Council message already to the Taliban and so forth, uh, talking about what it is that we hope to see, et cetera, et cetera. There's been a grouping of 100 countries that have also put out a, a diplomatic statement uh, in that regard. Um, and, and yes, we don't have folks in that beautiful $450 million embassy that you helped to, to build. Uh, and I, I must say, I did question publicly, why don't we keep people there? I mean, it's very clear the Taliban are not going to pick a fight with the United States. They won. Uh, they got what they wanted. Uh, what they should be doing now is thinking over the next horizon. Again, how are they going to fill this extraordinary fiscal uh, gulf that they are going to have? And as was pointed out, Afghanistan doesn't generate that much of its own electricity, certainly nothing that's very organic other than some hydropower. As you well know, a lot of it is imported on lines from the north and elsewhere. Uh, and then a lot of the refined fuel products that fuel the rest, that generate the rest, uh, again, come from neighboring countries as well. But there is linkage via Qatar. That is where our embassy is going to be. That's historically where the negotiations have taken place. And so that's a natural location for it, I think. There will be other countries that will be grouped there undoubtedly. But again, we're in a virtual world. It's not as if you have to have someone in Kabul, even the Taliban have demonstrated a, a remarkable facility uh, for social media already and a, and a real zest for public relations. Now, they may want to remove the four guys with AK-47s from behind the spokesman who is talking about the rights that will be allowed in the new Afghanistan. Uh, but again, we can reach them and, and we can do it through a whole variety of ways. Um, and even in terms of seeing what's going on in the ground, certainly some of the journalists have left, but by no means all of them. Um, but beyond that, there is an enormous amount of social media. I think um, Ambassador Rahmani does raise a point, what happens if the country, if the lights, it's not just lights that go out because of a failure to pay for the imported electricity and refined fuel product, what happens if the internet goes down, then there would be a problem in all sorts of different ways, uh, obviously. Uh, including trying to get those additional uh, individuals out to whom we do owe a great deal. And I was remiss in not adding beyond the SIVs, there are tens, if not maybe even hundreds of thousands of additional Afghans that you well know worked for the embassy, uh, AID, various intelligence organizations, uh, and then all of the enabling partners, not to mention the civil society groups that were promoting the kind of interest that can get indeed the ambassador was engaged in in her pre-diplomatic career. So I think there's lots of ways to certainly to engage. Um, this is all part of, you know, we jumped, we, you're, you're right to, to ask, you know, what is the overall strategy? I think actually that's pretty clear. Again, our core national security interest is to ensure that extremists cannot reestablish a sanctuary on Afghan soil the way Al Qaeda did when they planned the 9-11 attacks in Eastern Afghanistan under Taliban rule, which of course led us to go in there in the first place and was really the key objective of staying, uh, which was to ensure they couldn't reestablish it. Something that as you recall, they tried to do on a number of different occasions. And then more recently, of course, to disrupt and degrade the capabilities of the Islamic State against which a very substantial campaign was pursued with the Afghan national security forces and government back in 2019. Uh, that's the core. But there's a host of other interests, of course, that all surround this and, and within a context within uh, the relationship with Afghanistan will be pursued. And But a great deal of this, I think, clearly depends on the Taliban. Uh, and again, what will the nature of their governance be, their rule? Will there be summary justice? Will the soccer stadium that has been filled with soccer fans for the past 20 years once again, be used for summary executions. Um, again, these are all unknowns, and I think they will determine a great deal of what is possible. Again, we may want to uh, provide a lot of humanitarian assistance and undoubtedly will through 
United Nations through neighboring countries. There's a lot of different vehicles that, that are very well known international organizations, uh, but even some of them have left, of course. Uh, but the real question is over the longer term, can we really bring ourselves to support what are essentially our former enemies on the battlefield if they don't actually demonstrate uh, a very different character of governance, uh, just our own domestic political uh, limitations on that policy uh, will preclude that uh, if they are not able to do that. And if that is the case, the future, the near term and indeed the midterm for our former Afghan partners there and Afghan citizens writ large uh, is going to be fairly dismal. Yes, thank you very much. Ambassador Romani, you, you've worked with the civil society before and with NGOs. How do you think civil society and NGOs can work to help mobilize their own governments internationally and bring together opinion to a, a coordinated strategy that can help increase leverage on the, the Taliban to do the right thing? As, as General Petraeus says, it's going to be up to the Taliban to decide to do the right thing, but certainly we can create as much leverage as possible and pressure as possible to nudge them in that direction. How would you see that evolving? Let me explain what civil society was 20 years ago and how it evolved over 20 years, um, first of all. When the Taliban were in power, in uh, the whole, in fact, the whole era of 1990s, uh, the civil society emerged uh, in a very covert way trying to do stuff in hiding uh, in order to educate the kids, in order to provide some training for the women. Uh, and, and that was uh, with no monetary incentives. That was not, uh, that was uh, operations in uh, hiding. Uh, it was, if, if they were found, uh, they would have been uh, punished and imprisoned and whatnot. In fact, I happen to know many of those organizations who were functional during the uh, Taliban and they were providing some sort of training or uh, school education uh, to the girls uh, and boys alike, but particularly to the girls. And even the way they were functioning, uh, if the girls were to go to that neighbor's house who was providing classes, they would wrap their books in, in uh, cloths pretending that they were Quran or, or maybe uh, they were uh, bringing it or mixing it with a bag of the fabric, another thing, pretending that it's a sewing class or something like that in order to do what they were doing. And they would throw their books out if there was a knock at the door. Uh, so that was a very uh, um, self-emerging uh, concern, civil society, but very, very minuscule at the time. Then uh, after the intervention, it completely mushroomed. It, it became so much bigger. So many groups came uh, about and they did a lot of activities and um, they really evolved and developed. But they then the reason I am uh, explaining this evolution is that they were also supported by the uh, international community massively with, through funding, through protection, through advocacy, through the conditionality that the uh, international community continuously asserted on the government, uh, ensuring that they would have a platform to function. So now in the as the plug is off, it is even harder for civil society to get themselves together. Particularly, it is not a government that the civil society could possibly do what they are expected to do, bridging between the people and government, uh, because it is not the form of the government that, that is allowing uh, or the, the assessment is based on the experience from the past that would uh, allow basically people to um, have the same sort of freedom of expression and, and function with the same liberties and rights that they had over the past 20 years. 
So if the civil society is critical of the government, even in a, a constructive way, I'm not so sure how much it would be tolerated. So in fact, the members of the civil society are now uh, the ones that are uh, the most worried. They are in hiding. They are worried about their own lives. Uh, and, and they are seeking to get uh, find uh, and seek refuge somewhere safe for themselves. So uh, the whole notion of uh, having a civil society, which would be one of those pillars of counterterrorism strategy to be successful is now in question with an authoritarian government that would suppress anyone that would go and speak against it. So thus they're very dependent on their partners, their former partners in other countries to be mobilizing support uh, to help them at this time. And indeed. Indeed, right. So Shamila, what kind of, are, are there levers, mutual interests that we can use with some of these neighboring countries like Pakistan and others to get them to take a more constructive role going forward? Um, we have to recognize that, for example, right now a number of the borders are shut. Right. People are not letting refugees come across those borders. And you can understand they might want assistance and support to do that, but there's a there's a need also a very immediate human need, plus the longer term needs of actually building a sustainable uh, regional situation that is not chaotic. What yeah. what are some of your thoughts about those the the levers and the mutual interests that are out there? So your question, Ambassador Wayne, is giving me PTSD. I mean, this is the question we asked ourselves. <laughs> General Petraeus knows what I'm talking yeah, about. I <laughs> so I'm going to just lay it on the table. We don't have troops in Afghanistan anymore. That means we don't need Pakistan for air or ground routes. OK, we don't need them for those routes anymore. That means we have a completely different relationship dynamic, right? One which we can actually take advantage of in terms of pursuing our interests more aggressively with Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban, okay? If I were Pakistan, I would not feel so comfortable about that, right? And if you've watched them um, in the past few weeks, um, they've been engaging in some very quiet, sometimes not quiet diplomacy in the region. There was a visitor, there was a visit to Tehran of the foreign minister, and he met his counterparts from Central Asia as well. And they're trying to, you know, put out messaging that they're following the international communities guidelines here. So they're saying all the right things, just like the Taliban are saying the right things, like their style has changed, but we don't know if they've actually changed. And so I think that, um, that so there's history to consider. The U.S. is now kind of like leaving, us leaving has equalized things, meaning we're, we share with the rest of the region concerns about spillover, Right. So the Pakistanis and the Russians and the Chinese, they may be quietly like kind of giving each other high fives and, and, and saying we told you so and engaging in some schadenfreude right now. But I do think they're actually worried. Right. Central Asia is Russia's backyard. Right. Pakistanis don't want any more instability than they already have on their border. They can't control it. Correct. Um, they don't want to become a pariah state. They don't want to see sanctions coming their way. So I actually think that, um, and then also if you think about the EU and the concerns of migration, they're going to be paying attention a lot more. Turkey is poised to play a much, much stronger diplomatic role for its own kind of reasons and interests. So this, this is actually a much better landscape for the US, despite kind of the instability right now. And if you're an Afghan, it's not great at all. But I do think that, um, if done right, the US can pursue quiet diplomacy with, in terms of its bilateral relationships with these countries, but then also do it within the context of, of some kind of regional infrastructure that's more inclusive. It's got, it has to be uh, regional because we don't wanna be seen as kind of having our own, um, kind of still being involved in controlling the show when we've said that we've departed and there has to be regional ownership. Yeah, I, I strongly agree with your last point. We need to be a lot more modest here, but still active in bringing people together. And that means working with partners and allies. So in that connection, General Petraeus, so what kind of actions can help rebuild credibility, which has been damaged, I think, by on many different accounts recently? And what would this look like in going forward? Would you see of us, if we take Shamila's idea, 
and try to bring people together in a, a an effort to support a, re, a, a regional cooperation, maybe. And also, we want to try and bring our rivals in, right? Russia and China. So, what would that, what might that look like? Well, I think again, it has largely begun. It's very early stages. Uh, it's just nascent, but of course, the initiative in the UN Security Council just this week is significant. Uh, the initiative with the 100 countries that all signed on to the communique and so forth is significant. Uh, if you follow the flurry of phone calls that the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State have made, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen as many phone calls in a single day, at least since maybe the 2008 financial crisis or something of that nature, uh, they are burning up the phone lines and presumably there's lots more going on behind the scenes by ambassadors in different countries and all the rest of that. But let's zoom out a little bit and remember that of course the grand context for this is, the, is, is exactly right what the administration is trying to pursue, which is to uh, develop a comprehensive, integrated and cohesive whole of governments with an S on the end, with all of our partners and allies around the world together, approach to the most important relationship in the world, which is that with China. Uh, we are in an era of renewed great power rivalries. The rise of China, which is so unprecedented in what they have achieved over the past 42 years since Deng Xiaoping welcomed the world to China, uh, truly has changed the, the global context. And it really is, you know, if you think of the U.S. as the guy in the circus that gets a plate on a stick and gets it spinning and then, you know, and a superpower has to keep a lot of plates on a lot of sticks spinning, the biggest plate, probably bigger than all of the others together, is that which does represent this relationship with China. And one that, again, this administration, to be fair to them, because I have obviously been critical about or at least called into question the approach on Afghanistan, I'm broadly in agreement with about 95% of what they are doing, which is devoted to this biggest of relations. And they went about this very skillfully. They engaged our Asian partners, they engaged the Quad, other Indo-Pacific uh, powers all directly at summit levels, even if virtually went to the G7 summit, did the EU summit, did a NATO summit, picked up the other countries that we hadn't engaged along the way, even engaged with Russia uh, directly. Uh, before really starting the serious engagement with China. Now, we've obviously had our attention diverted very, very massively. And I think one of the big miscalculations was the idea that if we pull out of Afghanistan, it will take that issue off the Situation Room table. I mean, how's that working out? All they've done is had Afghanistan at the Situation Room table. But again, now if you can get that back into the diplomatic realm and refocus on what is most important in the world. So you then ask, how do you in a sense, shore up your credibility and your reputation that I think without, you know, it's inarguable that this has been damaged in some way, at the very least by the way that we have withdrawn, if not the actual withdrawal itself that resulted in a replacement of a government, again, however imperfect, was democratically elected, allowed the freedoms we cherish, part of that greater strategy that we might talk about, replaced by the Taliban. So how do you do that? Well, again, I think you get back to the focus uh, on the Indo-Pacific. You continue the rebalance to Asia. You continue the big reforms of our military services, of our entire whole of government approach to that. Keep all of those other plates spinning. And, and again, to be fair, I think they've done this quite skillfully. In every other case where there is an Islamist extremist group that threatens us, uh, in Iraq, we're staying, no combat forces, but we weren't doing combat anyway, and that made things difficult for the leadership in Baghdad. Uh, but we'll keep our intelligence surveillance reconnaissance assets, other enablers, intelligence fusion, staying in northeastern Syria, a place from which the previous uh, government, of course, you know, impulsively left and went back, staying and went back to Somalia, reversed that particular uh, step by the previous government, staying in probably 7,000 or so uh, troops in various locations in Africa and a host of others, while also, of course, trying to keep in perspective all the other challenges that are out there, whether it's North Korea, cyber, Russia, Iran, um, domestic population, you know, the, the pandemic, uh, the global uh, economy, and on and on. And I think we just have to show that steadiness, uh, that, again, the credible steps to lead 
And now with respect to Afghanistan, it has to be how do we lead all those others and work with them and truly, by the way, do it in a consultative manner, noting that, again, if you talk to our closest allies, and I was just at lunch with one of them, uh, representative of them, um, you know, they are quite openly critical. You hear the speech by the member of parliament, Tom Tugendhat, uh, or the criticism of the UK Minister of Defense or other major NATO uh, leaders and so forth, they do not feel that they were consulted on this. They felt that they were informed. So again, do some after action review, as we say in the military, after a particular operation of policy implementation and ask how can we do all of that better, uh, but with recognition of the new reality in Afghanistan, the problem being, of course, that again, so much of what we will be able to do and, and should do will be dependent on the Taliban. Uh, again, their actions will in very significant ways circumscribe what many of the governments of the world will be able to do, even if we would want to do more to help the Afghan people. If the nature of that regime is uh, as horrible as it was in the late 1990s, again, we can have hope that that will not be the case, uh, but that's not, not a method, it's not a strategy. Uh, we have to see what, what do they really do. And that is going to be keenly interesting uh, in the days and weeks that lie ahead without question. Thank you very much. I mean, you've made quite clear it's, it's a very big, a very complex agenda and it's not gonna get any easier. So the demands on US diplomacy are, are higher than ever. So let me, let me ask Ambassador Romani and, and Shamila, going forward, since we are coming up on the anniversary of 9-11 uh, and then shortly the anniversary of our involvement in Afghanistan, what would you say are one or two takeaways that all of the students and faculty listening um, should think about from all from this experience. I know it's a big experience and we're gonna spend a long time in the United States and in Afghanistan thinking about, but what messages would, would you like them to take away from this conversation about what's important going forward now related to the last you know, 20 years? What do we take from this? And what should the United States think about? Ambassador Romani, do you have a- Sure. Message? Uh, well, to begin with, uh, I, I will share the one from uh, the Afghan perspective, the way, meaning the way we, we saw uh, some of the issues were, um, and uh, as the students are uh, moving forward, it might be useful to take that into consideration. Number one uh, issue was that when you have strategies that have uh, two sides uh, at the same time or uh, two uh, completely diverging um, messages at the same time, it leads uh, to the situation that we are now. Let me elaborate on that. So on uh, one hand, when you have a military surge and on the other hand, you have a specific deadline for withdrawal, that is defeating the purpose. This has been one of the biggest issues uh, over and over, the, the, the deadlines, the introduction of the deadlines uh, in terms of the presence of the troops uh, and the mission in Afghanistan that has contributed to, to what we are seeing today. Second, um, consistency. Uh, I have heard it over and over from many members of the US military yeah. and General Petraeus is here, you yourself, you were on the ground and, and you know, both, you, both of you know this uh, better than I do. But I have heard it uh, many times that uh, the, the troops questioned the mission. They were not sure. It was not always communicated clearly. And uh, th that consistency was not uh, very uh, uh, much there. Uh, thirdly, um, for any intervention that happens, uh, there is a degree uh, of uh, mirror imaging that is tolerable, meaning that when the US and international community went to Afghanistan, in certain cases, they tried to uh, 
overly emphasized on certain uh, cultural traits, uh, ethnic traits and whatnot, uh, that it, it became way more inflamed than it was before. Uh, ethnic di divisions uh, being one of it uh, at the top. Uh, and lastly, um, the uh, issue of accountability. Accountability is extremely important. That should be always taken extremely seriously. Um, whenever you turn a blind eye, whether uh, to the government that's in place and is not meeting it its own obligation, or uh, together uh, with the rest of the international community, how you coordinate, that provides grounds for losses, waste, and, and so much more. And this has been one of the major reasons of we are seeing what we are seeing today in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. A lot of excellent points there. Shamila, your thoughts? Oh, so I was a grad student at AU when 9-11 happened and studying international affairs, and it completely redefined the course of my career. Every job I took, every job I was offered because I was studying South Asia and the Middle East, and um, it was uh, defined by 9-11. When I started work at the State Department, one of my first meetings was with Ambassador Wayne on terrorist finance, and I learned uh, I was working on Southeast Asia at the time, and I learned just how complex um, running kind of a, a you know a, a war is because you you can't do it alone. You have to have a whole of government approach, but governments as well. And so what and and that followed us throughout these two decades that we couldn't do it alone. And a very important point for students: our history followed us wherever we went. So what that meant was. As we, as young foreign policy professionals, were trying to work on being the problem solvers of this war, we constantly had the rest of the world put in front of our faces the pages of a history from the, you know, the Soviets in Afghanistan and what the U.S. did at that time. And we were not, I, I don't think we were best prepared to kind of contend with that. And so... Um, because policymaking is urgent and you don't have time to read. You should have done that before you, you got your job, right? And so I, I, want, I can't emphasize enough like what it means to understand America's role in the world um, historically and, and to digest it and digest it with humility. So when you go overseas and you do the work that you know needs to be done to protect your fellow citizens, that you have to kind of also be able to see it from the eyes of the Afghans or the Pakistanis or the Chinese. That's something that I think the world thinks we don't have. I know we have it. I know we have it. We just haven't been able to show it in, in kind of a genuine, honest way. So I'm just going to take this opportunity to say something that's completely unrealistic, but to, just, you know, to, to really understand America's role in the world and to study it as you go out and, and do these practical jobs. Thank you very much. A lot of a lot of wisdom in there, and and that's right. What I learned from 9-11, I was with Colin Powell in Lima when 9-11 happened. I flew back with him and figured out we better do something from the economic perspective on terrorist financing, and we started doing that. So many people contributing so many different ways to try and get this right. Um, General Petraeus, what's your, your word of wisdom to all these hopefully better than this generation of international uh, actors and leaders for the United States? Well, clearly we have to learn from uh, what we did uh, in Afghanistan, which certainly had achievements, successes, uh, but also, as you well know, a lot of setbacks, a lot of shortcomings, a lot of mistakes. I think it's important to note that in that regard, that we did not even get the inputs right in Afghanistan until about the end of 2010. This is nine years into the Afghan war, uh, a large part because of course we quickly shifted our focus to Iraq and then Iraq became the, the war as Admiral Mullen put it, as you'll recall, Tony, in Iraq we do what we must, in Afghanistan what we do what we can. Uh, and it wasn't until the Obama administration, the, the surge in Iraq, it allowed us to draw down uh, and then finally, we could focus on Afghanistan. You had the policy review of 2009 and the gradual introduction of additional forces. But by inputs, I'm talking about the right approach, the right strategy, the, just the decent understanding of the country uh, that you invaded uh, some years earlier and all of the different traditions and cultures and religions and, you know, 
ethnic and sectarian and the other groupings and all of the rest of that. Um, and, and again, it was the right level of resources, which the ambassador rightly noted, we announced a buildup and in the same speech announced, but we're gonna start drawing down in the summer uh, of 2011. Now, even if you have to do that, you don't necessarily want to tell the enemy that. I refused to tell Congress, as you'll recall, during the surge in Iraq, that we were actually going to draw down at the end of 15-month tours for our army. I knew we were going to. We had to. There's no alternative. But I wasn't going to tell them, which would be to tell the enemy the same thing. And we did, as the ambassador rightly noted. I mean, we made it clear we want to leave. And if you're trying to negotiate, even if you have Richard Holbrook as your negotiator, as we did, uh, for that period that you and I were together, first at Central Command, then in Afghanistan, and then even in the CIA, if you have that, um, even he can't negotiate from a foundation that is weakened because the enemy knows you want to go home. And of course, the previous administration's negotiation where we said, basically, we want an agreement that will allow us to go home. I mean, what kind of foundation is that? And we excluded the very government of the country that was democratically elected about which we were negotiating and then forced them to release 5,000 detainees that provided almost immediate reinforcements to the Taliban for the fight that lay ahead. Um, so again, we should recognize we didn't get the strategy, the resources, the, the right people even, the preparation of our forces, the organizational architecture sounds very uh, technical and jargonish, it's crucial. We didn't have all of that uh, put together, uh, indeed, until nine years uh, after we intervened uh, in Afghanistan. And then I think the words that the others offered about being a bit humble, being modest in our aspirations and in our, in our actions, understanding we don't have the right answer. Our solution is not always the right solution for everywhere else. Really trying to understand, again, the context uh, in which we are operating, uh, understanding that these threats that we were dealing with, not just in Afghanistan, but elsewhere, require a sustained, sustainable commitment. Of course, you can't sustain it unless it's sustainable, measured in terms of blood and treasure expenditure. Uh, and we are doing that in every other place right now, with the exception, uh, obviously, of Afghanistan, where, again, I felt there was a sustainable, sustained commitment alternative, but obviously it was not the one uh, that was chosen. Um, I would just uh, offer a, a slight counterpoint. Um, when you and I were there, Tony, I felt that the military missions, really the overarching missions, were actually very clear. Our missions were to halt the momentum of the Taliban, to roll it back in key areas, to accelerate the development of the Afghan National Security Forces. And for those who think that nation building was where it all went wrong, if you don't build a nation, or at least some elements of it, how do you hand off tasks to them so that you can gradually draw down your forces, your uh, diplomats, your development workers, your intelligence officers, and all the rest of that. So that was inevitable and, and absolutely necessary. Um, and then of course, to always ensure that Al-Qaeda couldn't reestablish the sanctuary it had when it planned the 9-11 attacks there, and also to be a platform, which some people overlook at times, Afghanistan was a spectacular platform for the regional counterterrorism campaign uh, that included the most obvious operation of what you know public was the one that of course brought Osama bin Laden uh, to justice toward the end of our time uh, in that particular tour. Um, so again, I felt now you can say later on, it became a little less clear that, and again, all that may be uh, certainly at the very least arguable, but I felt that at that time, at that particular period, having had the Obama policy review, that it was a period of, of somewhat unique clarity and unique resourcing, albeit with an impatience already uh, to begin the drawdown. If I could, I'll just draw out then and, and offer that we had a sign on the wall of the operations center that all the way back in, into the beginning of the invasion of Iraq when I was the two-star general and commander of the great 101st Airborne Division. And it was in every one of those subsequent commands, three and four star in Iraq as well, Central Command, and of course in Afghanistan. And it asked a question. It asked, will this operation take more bad guys off the streets than it creates by its conduct? And if the answer to that was no, you're supposed to go sit under a tree until the thought passes. The same is true of policies. Um, and, and candidly, along the way in this greater war on terror, we pursued policies that very much created far more bad guys than they took off the streets 
uh, by their implementation. I mean, the most significant, the most glaring of those were at the beginning in Iraq when we fired the Iraqi army without telling them what their future was, and then compounded that by firing the Iraqi Ba'ath Party. Now, don't get me wrong, we needed to go after Saddam. We were proud to get his two sons in the 101st area of responsibility. But when you went down to the level of professors at Mosul University, 110 of them who were tenured, and they're all fired, and they have no opportunity left in life because there is no, not, no uh, private university uh, in Iraq, um, you've just created hundreds of thousands of individuals whose incentive is to oppose the new Iraq rather than to support it. And it took us many years in Iraq until the surge, actually, to get our true reconciliation process going to regain the, the losses, if you will, uh, that we sustained during that period. And we could, you and I could come up with a number uh, as well for Afghanistan. So that question asked about policies as well as possible operations I think it's a pretty profound one and a pretty profound test of anything that you're considering doing uh, really anywhere, but particularly in these kinds of conflict situations. Thank you very much. I think that notion of having built in serious reflection as you're thinking of what you do next and what are the results gonna be is really important. And we didn't get to do that a lot of times. It was sort of like we were just rushing to stay afloat and, and it's hard in war situations and you make mistakes, but you've got to try and build that in. And especially if you're racing against time. And again, I understood the urgency and I understood the need to have in a sense a deadline for the Afghans, not just for us. Uh, but you also have to ask what is the effect of that on, on how you carry out operations? Does it mean that you rush in some times when you probably shouldn't? Did we throw money at at problems just because we had the money and we had limited time, uh, the answer obviously to that is, is yes. Did that compound some of the problems that we had when it came to uh, corruption, malfeasance and all the rest? Certainly the answer is yes. So again, I think we have to learn from all of that uh, and truly look back at all of that with a very open-minded sense of inquiry. I think one of the important things coming out of this whole experience is that we do have a serious uh, lessons learned exercise that is not politicized, yes. but is really intended for us to be smarter as a country going forward. That's going to be really hard to do as many of these other things. And I want to thank all of, thank each of you for being with us. There were a lot of good questions in the chat that we didn't get to. I'd be happy to, for those of you who are students at AU and SIS, I'd be happy to find opportunity to talk through some of those chats if we're, uh, when we're together over the weeks ahead. But thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Ramani. Thank you very much, Shamila Chowdhury. And thank you very much, General David Petraeus for being with us and, and helping us launch this period of reflection of 20 years after. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again, Ambassador. Thank you.